All right, here's why I have to do recon missions to see where I'm going to go camping at. Because I can't, I don't have any guaranteed access to my campsites. And this, we're heading down to one of my favorites, and I really wanted to come camping here. But I can't. And I'll show you why. Because they put up a freaking gate. Now we can't get to the good campsites anymore. That's, oh. So I have to come out in advance and recon where I can go and where I can't. So I have to spend a day riding around the forest trying to find campsites that are accessible because they end up shutting these gates and they never open them. It's driving me absolutely bonkers. I'm half tempted to run for Congress just so I can put an end to this kind of bull crap. Ugh. to camp and I've already started shedding some gear. Joe Boo had us a fire going. Uh, looks like he needs to gather some more firewood so I'm gonna go ahead and set up camp and he's gonna get started on lunch. I don't know what he's brought. He said he's got it all in the bag and he's gonna hook me up. So I think I'll set the tent up over there and we'll get busy around camp. I know somebody's going to ask, this is an Ontario Rat 7 field knife, and that saw you saw me use earlier, that's a Silky Gomboy, excellent saw for about 40 bucks. Thanks to Joe Boo's Haitian bushcraft skills, we got us a fire going. I'm not sure about these little hot dogs though. These might be all right for your size, but I'm gonna need something a little more substantial, I think. All right, Joe Boo's little mini hot dogs are hitting the spot. You say you brought dessert too? All right. All right, I gave you a pass on those little hot dogs. They were pretty good. These little marshmallows ain't gonna cut it. Oh, hot, hot. What kind of crap is this? Give me that. Now, another thing we get to talk about this trip is flashlights. I've always had some mediocre flashlights, but I got some gift cards for Christmas last year. And I took all of them and bought some decent flashlights. Now, we'll go over them once, they, once it gets dark. Uh, but first, we've got the uh, Olight Baton 3. Comes in a little recharging case. And I think I showed this in one of my delivery videos. I normally carry this light. And it clips to a hat, you know, does whatever. It takes the place of a uh, headlamp. And they're pretty bright. I'll, uh, I don't know that all the specs off the top of my head, but I'll annotate everything in here as to how bright these are. And I didn't pick them for their overall brightness, but for their run times at certain brightnesses. Um, this one, I just wanted something, when I get up in the middle of the night, this thing is uh, very low powered, and it'll run for like a month or something like that on this, on this level. And when it's dark and you've got some night vision, you're accustomed to the dark and you got just a little bit of light, that's a lot of times that's what you need and that's why the big reason why I bought this one but it's got other modes that you know it definitely gets brighter uh, I don't tend to use those modes I tend to keep it on the lowest mode and this charging case will recharge it like 3.4 times or something like that I just say three plus so I just say it recharges it three times and I get a little more than a little more than three times uh, 
another one is in the tent. We'll, we'll wait till it gets dark to show that one. I've already showed it actually, or shown it in one of my delivery videos. It's the Olight O bulb, and that's just going to be kind of like my little lantern. Uh, we'll try to see how that works. Now, this one here is the big boy. This is the Phoenix. I think it's called an LR. Yeah, LR 35R is what this one is. And I just wanted one that was just a, a mega friggin' light. In fact, this thing is like just short of a lightsaber. If I hit the power button, you see that it flashes? That's because it's locked out right now. It, it can't be used. And when you're transporting it in a bag, you want to keep it in that lockout mode. And here's why. And this thing in its brightest mode is at 10,000 lumens, and it's hot right now. It's burning my hand. And so that's why you keep it in that lockout mode when you're transporting it, so you don't set your bag on fire. Well, I did say every time I came out here to go camping, we'd sit around the campfire and tell an Uncle Voodoo's army story. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to enjoy a cigar while we do that. Uh, let's see, where were we? Uh, we did the Voodoo story, talking about how I got the name Voodoo. If you haven't seen that, I'll put a link somewhere for you. Because uh, I did 10 years in the military. I was in the infantry with the 10th Mountain Division. Did lots of things. Some crazier than others. All right, so what we do. Uh, we talked about the voodoo story. Uh, we'll do a redo. This is the st story that started it all. It kicked off the whole... Army Story video series that I did in the past. I was on a, I was a guest on a podcast or something. I can't remember what it was. And I made a comment how I took a squad of guys. You know, I think there's eight of us or so, eight ten guys in the squad, and we defeated a ten thousand man infantry division by ourselves. And people were just kind of baffled at how that could be the, the case. How could that happen? So, to tell the story, this is kind of like where uh, my legend started to build, because I had a reputation by the time I left as being somebody you didn't trifle with, and I could get things done. And a lot of times the term, uh, that guy's crazy, came up. And it wasn't that I was actually crazy, or did stupid things was that I would think outside the box a bit and do things people weren't expecting. And so they kind of uh, so had that perception as just out of the blue, this guy did some nutty shit and pulled it off. And this is the story that started that. So I was a young corporal at this time, a fire team leader in the infantry. And at Fort Drum, we had a base commander who wanted to start a field exercise where he would do this exercise every year where everybody on base would go to the field and, you know, work together, anti-aircraft versus with artillery, with infantry. You know, we'd all work as a unit, and he wanted to evaluate his fighting force that way. But they needed a bad guy. They needed somebody to go up against and so our company was tasked with providing two platoons of OP-4, which is opposing force or opposition force. That's what OP-4 means. And I was one of the ones tasked to be in this group of bad guys. And so the field exercise was supposed to last like three weeks, I believe, something like that. And they gave us two MREs and four quarts of water and said, that's all your rations you're getting for this field exercise. If you want to survive and you want more food, you're going to have to engage with this infantry division that's out there, and you're going to have to take it from them. 
Now that, that was our mission. So we had a really cool company commander at that time, and he went with us. He wanted to play bad guys too. And I think he was former enlisted, and he became a commissioned officer later. And so he he was one of the people, or one of the officers, that really uh, took to heart what his NCOs had to say. And he had some experience as an NCO himself. And when we got out there, he broke everybody down by squads, and each squad had a task. Because uh, this was 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. And at that time, uh, radios weren't great still. We still had, like, sound-powered telephones with a wire that you ran through the woods, you know, to talk to different foxholes and things like that. And we still had radios from, like, Vietnam and shit. And so people were tasked with, like, finding communication lines and cutting them just doing different things like that to harass people. And my squad was tasked with stealing vehicles. We had to go out and steal any vehicle we could find. And we couldn't just steal it. We had to engage in some kind of fight and win and then take the captured vehicle because the driver of the vehicle assigned for it. And so we couldn't just take his equipment. So he had to come with us and in order for him to come with us, we had to take him out. And that meant taking out whoever was with him as well. So we had to go fight, win, take the vehicles. And it was like the first day or two we were out there. You know, we didn't have a whole lot of success. You know, we're walking through the woods trying to find, you know, anybody. And we came across two guys in the woods just standing around. And we're like, what do these guys do? You know, we're watching them from a distance. And we finally realized that they were part of an infantry company who had cached their rucksacks in that area. So all their gear was there while they were off doing some, some mission. And these two guys were left behind to guard their equipment. And so they were what they call people on profile where you have like um, some kind of injury or illness or something like that. And you have a doctor's note that says you can't walk but so far or things like that. And so the base commander wanted even those people out in the field for this exercise and so that's what these guys were and, and they were left behind to uh, pull guard duty even my squad leader was in the field for this one but he was on profile so he was back at like our headquarters where our company was and I was in charge of the squad uh, for this exercise so we go in we bum rush these guys you know take them out and we called the company commander to let him know, hey, we found a cache of a company's cache of rucksacks. And he's like, well, you can't take military equipment. You know. We could take their food so we could like dump their bags out and like find MREs and we could take that. Um, but if they had like a candy bar or something that they bought with their own money, we couldn't touch that. And so we just kind of kicked their, dumped their bags out, kicked stuff around, made, it, made a mess out of it. Uh, just so they knew we had been there, you know, kind of put our little seal on it. And we left. A while later, uh, I got a call from the commander. He said, you know what? He said, I'm going to send a truck to whatever coordinates. He said, I want you to grab all them rucksacks you can and drag them to where this truck's going to be and throw them on the truck because we're taking them. And so we're like, all right. So we had to turn around. We had to have done walk miles away and had to turn around and go back and find this. And as we're getting close to it, we could hear helicopters, you know, going overhead and you know then leaving we're like what the hell is going on now uh, this, this is the old like Huey helicopter and as we got to where we could see what was happening those two guys apparently had called their company and let them know that their the jig was up we knew where their uh, area was and so they had sent helicopters in to land and these guys were dragging the rucksacks out and throwing them on the helicopter and they were being choppered off to another location. And so we got down in like a ditch, you know, we're like looking up over, watching it. And Fort Drum had like almost every ter form of terrain there was. And this was kind of like a sand duny area. And so every time the helicopters would land, sand would, you know, kick up. And the guys would like cover their faces with their, you know, shirts and jackets and things. And then, you know, load, load the helicopters. And so I told my guys, it's like, all right, look, when the helicopters come back, as soon as they land and they cover their faces, we're getting up and we're running, we're gonna bum rush them. 
you know, you and you take out those two guys, you, you, you and me, we're going to jump in the helicopters and kill the pilots, and then we'll capture those vehicles. They said vehicles, helicopters, vehicle, we'll take those. So, so here they come. They come in, they, as they're landing, you know, the guys cover their faces, go, we go. And I just run straight for a helicopter. I, I ran for the, first, the lead helicopter, and I jumped in, you know, put a gun to the pilot's head, told him to cut the engine off, you know, he's dead. And, you know, the rest of my guys did the same. And we were trying to figure out how do we, how do we secure these helicopters. And so we ended up having to call the referees, they're called OCs, uh, observer controllers. And one of them came and said, look, you can't take these helicopters. So we'll take them out of the fight. We'll send them back to the airfield and they have to sit for 72 hours and they can't be used. Uh, but you can't have them. And we're like, well, whatever, you know, give us credit for it at least. And so as we're kind of ending that discussion, I start hearing gunfire. You know, just, you know, not too far away, but in our general vicinity. I'm like, what the hell is that? And so I leave them guys and I go to see what's going on with this gunfire. And it's my guys. They've engaged another group of guys. And we have no idea who they are. But as we, you know, kind of bound over the sand dunes, we see like tents and things. So there's an encampment there. I don't know how big it is or anything like that. And we just assault through the, the thing, wipe everybody out. And it ends up being a platoon of anti-aircraft uh, gunners. These were the 20 millimeter Vulcan cannons is what they were, that, that's what they were there doing. And since we wiped them all out, they had a Humvee. And I'm like, all right, we're stealing your vehicle. You know, who's signed for the vehicle? We got to take it. And they're like, well, it's private so-and-so. And we're like, all right, you're dead, but you're coming with us and we'll, we'll release him back to you in 72 hours. That's, that's the rules of the game, that's what we're doing. And uh, they weren't thrilled with it, but we took off with their Humvee. And we had this kid driving for us because you know, he's dead, but he's got to play along. And so we get down the road a little ways. And he's like, man, he's like, I'm glad you guys showed up. We're like, why? Well, come to find out, he'd been in the Army just a couple of weeks. And this was like his first field exercise, and he was getting treated like crap by his sergeant. And he was making him stay up all night, pull a radio watch. He's like, I haven't had a night's sleep and, you know, since we've been out here. And I'm like, well, you'll, you'll get to chill out with us. You know, don't worry about it. So we take him back to our headquarters and you know, we've got his Humvee hidden away in the woods. And we're trying to decide if we can use it, you know, uh, to go uh, capture more vehicles, you know, instead of walking everywhere we go, can we use this Humvee? And the kid's like, hell yeah, he's like, I'll drive you anywhere you want to go. And he's like, I got a map. And he pulls out a map and it had like all the positions on it for the other side. We knew where his entire company was. We knew where, you know, air, artillery was. Uh, the MPs, we knew where everything was now. We're like, holy shit, you know, we know it all. We've got all this intel and a vehicle. And so we, what we did was, I came up with the plan, we'd take this kid out in his Humvee and just park along the tank trail somewhere, you know, on the side of the road, put the hood up like he had broken down, put his little triangles out on the road and everything, and then we would pull back into the bush while he stood there with the Humvee, and when another Humvee or truck pulled up to help, we would jump them, take that vehicle, and wrap everything up and get out of there with the new vehicle. And so we did that, and we were highly successful. We just kept stealing vehicles after vehicles after vehicles. Um, they ended up nicknaming the area where we kept all these stolen vehicles. It was called the parking lot because we had so many, it was just full. And we, we were really making an impact. But the real killer came when we uh, went out one day and we set up just like we were going to, you know, same thing. And we're pulled back into the woods waiting for somebody to come by. And pretty soon they did. Except it was a train of trucks, you know, seven, eight, ten trucks in a, you know, in a convoy. And they all stopped. And we jumped out and, you know, wiped out everybody. And so now we've got all these freaking trucks. And we're like, shit, we got to get out of here. You know, this is kind of... We've bitten off a little more than we can chew, maybe. we got to sneak these trucks out of here, get them secured and without being caught. And so we take off with the trucks, get them back to our area. Yeah, everything's squared away, and we're like, that was a good one. We, you know, call it in. We caught so many trucks and all that. And we got to ask, well, well, what's in them? Like, I don't know. We didn't even look. We just took the trucks. 
So we open up the back of the trucks and start going through what's in the back of these trucks, and it's full of food. I mean, it's just case after case after case of MREs, crates of oranges, crates of that milk that, you know, doesn't have an expiration date on it, uh, microwave meals, you know, it was just crates and cases of this stuff. It turned out that was the entire division's food supply for the rest of the uh, field exercise. We didn't know at that time. We just knew we had an ass load of food. So we were taking like the MRE cases and stacking them up like, uh, you know, bricks, making igloos out of them and shit, you know, because we didn't even have shelters. We're living under ponchos eating, you know, scrap MREs and things. Now we've got crates of oranges and uh, these microwave meals. We were just eating them raw, you know, just sitting around picking our teeth all fat <laughs> from all this food we had just, we just stolen. And... We got a call on the radio like the next day. Uh, we needed to turn all that food back in. And I'm like, oh, hell no. They said at the beginning of this thing, here's two MREs, here's four quarts of water. If you want any more than that, you got to steal it. Well, I stole it. And I was proud of that shit, and I took it. And I was like, no, I ain't giving it back. And so my commander, you know, he's back and forth with me a little bit. And I'm like, hey, that's the rules. We're, we're only playing by the rules here. It's their rules. We're playing and so he's like, all right, I'll, I'll back you on it. And so he called me a little while later. He's like, meet me down at the tank trail. He says, we're going to have to go to a meeting. I'm like, all right, whatever. So we go, I go down to meet him, and we're going to the command center. The talk is what they call it. Because we got to go talk to the general about stealing all his food. <laughs> so I, I kept telling the, you know, my commander, Look, it was their rules. We're playing by their rules and their game. That food was fair. It was fair game. We took it. It's ours fair and square. And so when we got to the meeting, you know, they're telling us, hey, you need to give us our food. That's the entire division's food for this exercise, and we can't replace it. You know, that's, we need it back. And I was like, well, you can't have it. It's ours. It's mine. That, that food is mine. And it, it got a little heated. Uh, but I ended up saying, all right, this is what I'll do. I'll give you your food back on one condition. That is you surrender. You surrender and say you lost this portion of the field exercise because they wanted to do a 72-hour ceasefire and restart the field exercise once they got their food back. So I told them, I said, we'll do all of that. But this first week that we've been out here, you lost and you make it official and tell everybody, all right, we surrender, we're gonna start all over, redo, and we're gonna go again. So that's how me and my eight guys ended up defeating a 10,000 man infantry division, brought them to their knees because we stole all their food. So yeah, logistics is something that, uh, you know, most people don't think about when uh, you think about combat and things like that. And for the rest of the exercise, you know, they were onto our tactics by then. They realized, hey, if you see a Humvee sitting on the side of the road with its hood up, don't stop. Call the MPs or somebody. Call backup. And so we lost that uh, uh, tactic that we were using. And it, it ended up turning into just a regular field exercise after that. But like the last, the second to last night of this thing, we were out on patrol and we came across a really big uh, encampment. And it was big. We, we couldn't hit it because we were too small of a force to hit this thing. So I was like, well, let's wait till it gets dark. We'll probe the perimeter and go in and see if we can ID what this place is because nobody, you know, we can't get any info on what this is. So when it gets dark, you know, we start cutting our way through the wires. It's surrounded by concertina wire and shit. And we go on into the perimeter and we're walking around. And we're just talking to people. They're just like walking up to us. Hey, what's going on? No, no not, not a whole lot. How are you doing? You know, not, not even realizing, you know, we're the bad guys. And they ended up giving us like their challenge and passwords and things, you know. So even if we did get challenged, we knew the password because they just told somebody else just told it to us. Um, and somehow a little bit of a skirmish broke out. Some of my guys, you know, because we had split up into a couple of different teams. And the other team got into a little bit of a firefight. And so we all, you know, agreed to rally back at the where we breached the wire and fall back to this uh, kind of a gully that we had set you know found that was going to be our rally point 
so a little firefight broke out. We all started moving back. We all made it. And our, my commander said to go back the following night. He's like, go back in there. Because we still don't know what this place is. And uh, it, this is the last night of the field exercise. He's like, just go in there. He's like, if you have to, just go for broke. Just light the place up. So we go back in. We're still trying to figure out what, what's going on in here. You know, who, the, what uh, unit this is, anything like that. We don't know. And so we get back in the wire <laughs> following night. And we're walking around like we did the first night. And we're talking to people again. And they're, you know, st just still walking up to us and talking to us. And they told us that uh, the previous night, Op 4 came in and caused some uh, trouble. But now they've got an infantry quick reaction force. So if the Op 4 shows back up, those guys are going to kick their ass. And so pretty soon we started telling them, oh, that's us. We're the quick reaction force. We're with such and such unit. And they're like, oh, cool, you know. And so we end up walking around in there, you know, just we're like picking up r radios like the old Vietnam Prick 77s. And we're like walking around talking on them, holding conversations with people, just making shit up, you know, just walking around inside this perimeter. And somehow I, I, somebody opened up a Humvee and like the real quick reaction force guys were in there. And one of them lit up with an M60. And so firefight broke out again. But this time, since we had been talking with the other guys, we convinced them that we were the quick reaction force on their team and we got them engaged in a fight with the actual quick reaction force that was there to take us out. And we're just kind of like, yeah, there they go over there. Yeah. And we got them all fighting amongst themselves. <laughs> and we all moved back to our, you know, out the, out the wire again, back to our little rally point. And by now it's starting to be early morning. The sun's starting to come up, you know. And we're like, well, the exercise is going to be over here pretty soon. Let's call in a mortar strike on the area, and we'll just wipe this thing out. We don't know what it is. We'll just, we're just we not even messing around now. It's the end of the exercise. Let's just wipe it out and get out of here. So we call in a mortar strike, you know, give our coordinates and everything where everything's at. And it's not a real strike. We've got to wait for the uh, OCs to come in. The evaluators got to come in, you know, check that our coordinates are right. You know, this is the place to be. And they're going to start throwing simulators around, you know, boom, boom, boom. All you guys are doing. And so we watch them, you know, pull up in their vehicles and start throwing their, their little simulators out. And we're just kicked back laughing. They're like, yeah, we got them, sons of bitches. And uh, they come over the radio, you know, index, the field exercise is over. You know, so we're going to just get up and walk over to the road and wait for our ride. And so we're walking past them. They're all dead. You know, we're kind of pointing and laughing at them and shit. And, uh. The evaluators were standing there and you know i talked to a few of them told them we were the ones that called in the mortar strike and all that he's like well where were you at when we came in and i was like we were over there in that little gully you know 100 yards away or so he said well he said you killed all these guys he said but we're gonna have to kill you guys too because even though you were that far away you're still hit because this is the ammo dump for the entire division. I mean, there were bombs in there. I mean, <laughs> there was everything was in there. You know, artillery shells, you know, you name it, it was in there. And he said the explosion was so big it would have hit, you know, such and such circumference on the map and our little gully was in that range. So he's like, I gotta kill you guys too. And we're like, all right, whatever. The field exercise is already over. Go ahead and kill us. So that was the only time we ever died during that field exercise. And we just wreaked so much havoc in there and stealing those vehicles. I said, we stole all their food. <laughs> they, they just lost their ability to fight. And uh, that was kind of the start of me thinking, you know, outside the box on a lot of things um, and trying to come up with my game plan um, as I'm going to do something that the enemy doesn't expect. Because a lot of the military uh, protocol, you know, is like, all right, if you get into a situation where the enemy does, you know, if they, if they do this, we want you to go like that. You know, and that shit, it goes out the window as soon as the bullets start flying. You, have, you always hear Mike Tyson's quote where everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And so that was my kind of modus operandi is I'd punch them in the mouth. And when their plan fell apart, that's when we would just pick them to pieces. And so that all started from that field exercise uh, where we took one squad and defeated 
10,000 man infantry division. True story. <laughs> Well, me and Joe Boo have had to do an emergency pack job. We were supposed to get some rain tonight, but it has turned into severe storms, so we're going to go ahead and pack it out of here. It's supposed to be some high winds and heavy, heavy rains, and we don't want to deal with that. So we're going to call it a night, but we're going to wait till it gets good and dark and test these flashlights out. Um, right now, I've got the camera's ISO cranked all the way up, and I've got a panel light on to hopefully get a little bit of light that way. We'll see how badass this big one is, and we'll even compare it to the headlight of the Himalayan. So, hang on a second. Well, all right, it is getting seriously dark out now, so we're going to kick on these lights and see how they work. Uh, this first one I've got on my hat, and the main reason I bought it was for what's called moonlight mode. If I kick that on, there, it's just barely on. This is just a tiny amount of light, and if you've got your night vision going, uh, this is basically all you need to get up and take a leak in the middle of the night or if you need to see a trail you know and you're not trying to just, you're trying not to disturb people things like that that works fantastic now if you kick this on in regular mode brighter there it is there's turbo that's the brightest mode and i don't run this at that brightness i bought it for that low light mode and at its brightest it's about what this one is in medium and it's you know mid mode and this thing will run for hours at that level or this one will only run for a matter of minutes at that level so let's kick this one on all right so here's the lowest mode this is its moonlight mode kick it up one now right here is about where this one was at its brightest and this is high There's the turbo mode on this one. You can see how bright this thing is. All right, just for giggles, I've got my phone out and I've got my headlamp on. And I'm going to turn this off now. And I'm going to turn off this light. I'm going to turn on the Himalayan headlight. So there's how much light the Himalayan puts out. Let's kick on the high beams. Now let's turn on this bad boy. There's a flashlight. There's the Himalayan. There's a flashlight. <laughs> Pretty badass. Pretty cool. Those are my new flashlights. Hopefully they serve me well. We are gonna go ahead and pack our everything else up. All we got left is the camera. I think Joe Boo's gonna walk on. I'm taking the bike. And get out of here before this rain comes. I'm hearing coyotes around me too. A little church here and there. Get out of here before they get frisky as well. Catch you guys next time.